tell me my great confident assurance the only God for me oh you're my hope you're the hope that holds stronghold to shelter me oh my great confident assurance I'm hidden in your strength, oh Lord, my God, most high, most high. Hey. Your hands of faithfulness keeps on shielding me. Ooh, I'm hidden in your strength. I'm Oh Lord, my God, most high, most high, your hands, your hands of faithfulness keeps on shielding me. Oh, you are my heart, you are my high, high. Deeply. yes, you are. My Massive arm protects me. Your word is my shield. Hey, my salvation. My
the Holy Ghost. I have freedom. I have freedom. I hear the sound of victory. Oh, 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 series this week and next week I call it the authority of the believer the authority of the believer over the past few weeks we have looked at the foundation of our faith built on the crucifixion the death the burial the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so after resurrection what next and so this two-part series will emphasize on our positioning who we are as children of God and then the authority we can exercise as children of God. Turn your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2 and let's read from verse 4 to 6. Ephesians chapter 2 from verses 4 to 6. Are we there? Shall we all read it together? One, two, go. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he hath loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Note that part, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Verse 6, and has raised us up together. Notice that part again. Together, has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So you notice, number one, he quickened us together with Christ. Number two, raised us up together. And number three, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. So what are we emphasizing? Number one, we died with him. We're buried with him. We're raised together with him. We were quickened together and raised together and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So the price for sin has been paid. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. We are people who have been redeemed, forgiven, and reconciled by the blood of Jesus. But we are still helpless and in bondage to the nature of sin. The full price has been paid on the cross. But we are still subject to sin by our sinful nature in an environment with the devil as the God of this world. Now, what the Bible is saying is that when we are dead in sins, he quickened us together. He raised us up together and he made us sit together in heavenly places. So the old nature has to be dealt with by crucifixion on the cross. Jesus Christ died and he was killed on the cross. And with him, we died with him. He didn't just go alone. We also went there with him and we died with him. To separate us from this old nature of sin, we died with him, we're buried with him, and we're raised up together. Now, the person that was raised up or resurrected was very different from the person who died. He died as a weak person. He died as a sinful person. He died carrying the curses of the, of the world. But he resurrected differently. He resurrected with all power and strength. He died as a lamb. He rose as a lion. A new creature or a new creation has to be introduced. A new species of man after God's, or God's own image is going to be introduced into the earth. Not under the sinful nature of Adam, but a new creature in God's very image. So 
we need to pay attention because what I'm going to share with you are foundations that anybody who's going to lead a victorious Christian life, you need to understand. You cannot exercise authority just by saying what somebody said. You exercise the authority because you know your authority. Is somebody here with me? You don't exercise your authority trying to imitate somebody. You exercise your authority because it is something you have and you understand who you have. We are going to read from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 to be able to understand a lot of things that have gone on so that we can exercise authority. Our redemption was achieved with the precious blood of a spotless lamb, which was a divine requirement. So let's read from 1 Peter chapter 1 from verses 18 to 20. One, two, go. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but manifest in these last times for you. Lift up your hand and say, I am precious. I am precious. Say it again. If somebody, you know, when you are redeeming something, usually you are buying back something which was originally yours. Now the Bible is telling us that in our redemption, we are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. So when God wanted to buy you, he didn't buy you back by giving money or by giving silver or gold or something um, from the earth. Okay, what did he do? He says, but with the precious blood, verse 19, with the precious blood of Christ. So how were you redeemed? You were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. God values you so much that the only thing he could use to buy you back was his own blood to die for you. So you are alive because he took your place and bought you back so you can come back to him. Don't you think that's valuable? Doesn't that place a price on you? Doesn't that make you see how God values you? You see, in this life, human beings may not value you because of where you come from, because of what you have, but you've got to learn how to place value on yourself by the way God sees you. How does God see me? As so valuable that he didn't just take dollars and pounds to buy me. He actually bought me with his own precious blood. Something that is so precious is what he gave so that I can be reconciled to him. If God will go that far to buy me with that much effort, then it means that I am precious in his eyes. It means that I'm not cheap. It means that I'm not ordinary. And therefore, I will not allow another person to demean who I am or to denigrate me. Everyone, body here, every person here, you are precious. And that is why, you know, sometimes... We, we must stand bold when somebody seems to be intimidating you and somebody wants to make you feel inferior or somebody wants to denigrate you or somebody wants to talk to you anyhow because you are precious no matter how or in what shape you come into this earth you have a right to be here you are precious God values you and therefore we must also begin to value one another because in the eyes and the sight of God you are valuable lift up your hand and say I'm valuable Say, I'm precious. Look at the person next to you and tell the person, you are precious. Ask the person, do you know that you are precious? Why are you precious? Because you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. The most valuable thing God had, that's what he bought you with. So when you sit here, you say, I am bought with the precious blood of God. It means that, Charlie, I see myself and my self-worth based on God not based on my tribe or my education or my finances or the, what I wear. I am valuable. Hello? So one of the things all of us are, are learning as a foundation of our faith is value. I am valuable. I am valuable. Let's go over some of the things that happened in Romans chapter 6 from verse 6. And let's see why we are going to be talking about the authority. Of the believer. Romans chapter 6, verse 6, we are going to read to verse 9. 
but we are going to take it slowly by force by by okay one two go knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed so that henceforth we should not serve sin let's take it slow knowing this it means that everybody must know something as a child of god what must you know it says that that our old man or our old nature is crucified with him so when jesus christ went to the cross how many of us went to the cross all of us even though physically he seemed to be the only person there we were also being crucified with him so the bible is saying that our old nature our old man is crucified with him what this means is that there's an old man and there's also a new man is somebody here with me okay so what happened to the old man the old nature the adamic nature it was crucified with him why so that the body of sin or the nature of sin that you acquired from adam will be destroyed because that nature of sin made you a servant of sin but that nature that old human nature which made you a servant of sin was crucified with him hello so your your propensity to sin or your natural inclination to do wrong god is saying that when i crucified my son on the cross I took that nature of you also and crucified it. Why? So that you will not be a slave to that nature and continue sinning. Somebody heard me. Okay, so let's look at verse 7. Why? For he that is dead is freed from sin. So when you die, you are free from what kept you in bondage. So he had to kill you. He had to let that nature die so that you become free the only way to make you totally free was to allow that nature to die so because he that is dead is freed from sin verse 8 now if we be dead with christ we believe also that we shall live with him so christ died what happened our old nature was crucified with him and our old nature also died to be able to free us from sin is somebody here with me are you following okay then what happened we believe also that Christ rose from the dead so we also rose with him and that is why I was telling you that he died a sinful person he died a weak person but he didn't resort the same way he died as a lamb but he rose as a lion he died carrying sin but he rose as the righteousness of God so you be, you, you need to understand what is happening and the Bible says that knowing this, that our old man died with him. Hello? Okay. So, verse 9. Let's all read verse 9 together to one, two, go. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. So there are things every child of God, every Christian, everybody who is going to be able to walk in faith, and live a victorious life these are foundational truths you know what must you know from verse 6 that our old man is crucified with him why was the old man crucified with him that the body of sin will be destroyed so that we will not become slaves to sin so number one my old man is crucified with him the nature of sin that was in me is destroyed number three i'm no longer a slave to sin you see you make these confessions and exercise your authority based on the revelation of what you know i know my old man is crucified with him why was he crucified with him so that i will not be a slave to sin why because anybody who is dead is free from sin so i had to die to be free because then the wages of sin is death and once i've paid it that sin no longer has a hold over me is somebody heard me so did you die yes did you pay for the wages of sin? Yes. So you no longer owe that debt. Because Jesus Christ took all of us to the cross. He died and paid the price for us. And we were with him. 
Okay. So I am crucified with him. A part of me died so that another part of me can live. We were sown in corruption but raised incorruptible. We are sown in dishonor but raised in honor. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 verse number 20. One, two, go. Uh, 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 everybody, one, two, go. I am crucified with Christ. Come on, say it again. I am crucified with Christ. So you see, not it wasn't just Christ alone. No. How many of us were crucified? I am crucified with Christ. Say, say it again. I am crucified with Christ. So when we talk about the cross, how many people went to the cross? All of us. Under the Adamic race, who was concluded under sin, for which the wages of sin is death. Huh? All of us were crucified with Christ. Say it again. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Wow. 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 You see, these, these are confessions you must make. So if somebody is beginning to ask you, when you are in school, one of the first things you learn to do in school is to write an essay. Who am I? My name is Kofi Mensah. My father's name is Kojo Mensah. My mother's name is AC Mensah. I was born on the 6th of January, so and so and so, isn't it? My birthday is so and so. My best food is so and so. My, friend, my best friend's name is so and so. I live at. Why? Because you are establishing your identity to make you know who you are. So the question is, who and what is your identity in Christ? I am crucified with him. Can you understand it? You, you, are, you are giving yourself an identity. Because if you don't know who you are, somebody will come and tell you who you are. I know who I am. I'm a child of God. I'm born of God. I have an identity in Christ Jesus. I am crucified with him. The old nature is dead and crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. These are confessions you need to make. Who are you? These are the things you see. Because without that strong foundation, you will not be able to be victorious in your Christian life because you don't know who you are. Say with me, I know who I am. Okay, so let's look at another verse. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans chapter 8, verse number 11. Now, it tells us how Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. So we know he was crucified, isn't it? But we are not going to see how he was raised from the dead. One, two, go. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you stop there so how was jesus christ raised from the dead the spirit there's a spirit of god that actually raised jesus from the dead uh-huh so when jesus was in the grave presumably dead the holy ghost went into the grave and raised him up from the dead so he was crucified on the cross he was buried but he was raised from the dead how by the spirit of god and the Bible is saying that, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. So the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead came to live in you. Wow. What does he do in you? He shall quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So there is the power of God that is able to raise a mutilated body, a dead body. And that same spirit is dwelling in you. Now you are not dead. So if you believe that God was raised, Jesus was raised up from the dead by that spirit. And that same spirit has come to live in you. Then that spirit can also work major things in your life. So when you say somebody is a child of God. Number one, he's a child of God or he's a Christian. Because the old nature has been crucified with him. Huh? And he died with Jesus on the cross. When he died, what happened? The spirit of God that came to raise Jesus from the dead 
has come to live in you also. That is why when we read the first verse, Ephesians, we said he has raised us up together. Do, do you remember that verse? Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. He says, even when we're dead in sins, hath quickened us together, hath quickened us together with Christ. Verse 6, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So Jesus Christ was quickened from the dead and then he was resurrected and ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father. Now the Bible is saying that even though he rose from the dead, he didn't rise alone. We rose with him. And even though he went to sit at the right hand of God, he didn't just rise alone. He were, we were also made to sit together with him. So who are you and where are you and what do you have? So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 from verse 17 and 18. Ah, one, two, go. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, if any man be what? In Christ. So you can either be in Adam or in Christ. And the Bible is saying that therefore, if any man be in Christ, so you can be in Christ or out of Christ. Hello? Read it again. One, two, go. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, what is he? He is a new creature. He is a what? It means that God has created something new and brought it upon the face of the earth. Wow. So apart from creation and Adam, God also brought another species on the face of the earth. Who are the new species in Christ? So once you receive Christ or you come into Christ, the Bible says you are a new creature. You are a new species of man upon the face of the earth. You are different from the Adamic race, which was a sinful race, which was created from the earth. Hello? Can you understand it? Are you following? Okay. So the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Look at it. He says, all things are passed away. What are the old things? The sinful nature, the curse of the law, the, the, the evil, whatever it is. The Bible says that when you say something is passed away, it's like the, the thing is dead. It no longer exists. All of a sudden, there's a new creature upon the face of the earth. All things are passed away. And he says, behold, all things are become new. All things are become new. We'll talk a bit more about that as we continue. But I'm just showing you the transition from the old to the new. Why we talk about born again. First Peter chapter 2 verse 23. First Peter chapter 2, verses 23. I'm happy when we come to church and we are doing a Bible study. And it's not just excitement of preaching and telling you you will prosper. But it's to let you know who you are. Because if you understand who you are, prosperity is a natural outflow. You cannot be the child of God and be broke and be poor. Because the old is what passed away. So the old Adam... You took your natural birthright from your earthly father. So think about it. If your earthly father was poor and broke and cursed, it means that your life on earth is going to be poor, broke, and cursed. Isn't it? If your natural father was some way, that is how he raise you. But now he says, no, you are all my children. I need to do something and deliver you from that kind of uh, 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 inheritance. So let me destroy that old nature and let me create a situation where you are now, you now have a new beginning with a new father who is not just earthly and determines how your life will be like forever. Let me give you a new beginning. When I begin to learn about these things or preach them again, 
I keep asking myself, how many of you come to church and are members of a church, but you are strangers from the covenants of promise? You are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You haven't been born again. You haven't identified with the death, the resurrection of Christ. You don't have God in you. You try to be religious, but it's not real. Because there's something that is not earthly. There's something that you can't fix. Is somebody here with me? Okay. But look at verse 13. But look at what it says. Everybody, one, two, go. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus. So how come today you can come now into the presence of God? It's because there was a blood that was shed for us. That is why he bought you with that blood so you could come into his presence. So without the blood of Jesus, without you receiving that word, you see, you may come to church, but you are far. You still don't have him. You may pretend, but you are out. So the old man is crucified. He was buried. He was, was raised with him. You were raised by the same spirit so you can walk into the kingdom of his dear son. I am no longer a created person. I am born again, not of corruptible, but of incorruptible seed. The old is passed away. I am a new creature. I am born again. So we are going to look at how Jesus himself described the born again experience. John chapter 3 from verses 1 to 8. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. A ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Verse 3, let's all read it together. One to go. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born again? When he's old, can he enter in the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Say it again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So there are things that are born of the flesh belonging to Mr. Diakwa. And there are things that are born of the spirit belonging to God. And the Bible says that if you are only born of the flesh, then you are flesh. But if you are born of the spirit, then you are spiritual. Hello? So you must be born of the spirit to be spiritual. You see, you don't become born of the spirit just because you start speaking in tongues or you start coming to church. You must consciously come to a point and say that today I am born of the spirit. Just like a particular day you were born of the flesh. And all of you remember your birthday in the flesh. And we celebrate our birthday because it's a particular day we arrived on earth. But there's another birthday that they were born of the spirit that we entered the spirit. Mm -hmm. hello because a lot is going to happen verse 7 marvel not that I said unto thee you must be born again verse 8 the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes so is everyone that is born of the spirit the whole concept of born again literally means you are born from above Nicodemus was a Pharisee and a master of the Jews. He was somebody who at least knew the Bible and was religious and was going to the temple and going to church, but he still didn't understand born again. He had a real need. He noticed the tremendous impact of Jesus' ministry. And even as a Pharisee, he came to Jesus and called him rabbi. He needed more than just rituals. He needed an encounter with God not just in ritualistic practices and observance of laws. He needed a change of heart. 
and a divine experience and an encounter what Nicodemus needed was a spiritual transformation you see he seemed to be doing everything on the outside right but he knew deep within that when he looked at Jesus Jesus was living a life that was very different from all of them and so he says nobody can do these things except he comes from God so even though we are going to church we are paying our tithe we are, we are following the fasting laws we are following the purification laws we still see something missing and truly I don't know God as I stand here I will tell all of you a very simple thing I am born again I've had an experience with God that leaves me in no doubt that he's alive I can't prove it by science. I can't prove it by argument. But I know why. Because the wind bloweth where it listeth. You cannot tell where it's coming from. When the wind is blowing, you can't tell exactly where it's coming from. But you feel it. And you can say the wind is blowing. So you may not be able to explain everything about being born again. But you will know something that Charlie, the wind is blowing. That I'm born again. I've had an encounter with God. I've met this Jesus Christ. He's alive. And I'm not just a church member. I'm not just going to church and trying to be religious and trying to follow after. There's something that has taken place. It's a real transformation. When we talk about the new birth of being born again, it's an act of God during which life from God, eternal life, is imparted to the person who believes. Just like when your father or your mother naturally gives birth to you, you carry his DNA. That is the same way when you are also born of God. The life that flows from God is what comes to you. It's a spiritual thing that allows you all of a sudden to be beyond your natural. It superimposes itself on a natural thing and gives you an identity of who you are. Being born again also carries the idea of becoming children of God. Why? Because you have received Jesus Christ as this, as the Savior of the world. John chapter 1 verse 12. Is somebody learning something today? Okay. Now everybody who comes to church must learn these things. And I pray that the new believer school, the cells, you will take this up and begin to talk about it. And let everybody know because there are too many people who are joining churches. There are too many churches that are full of people who are just church members. But when people have an encounter with God, I'll tell you something. It takes them beyond a church. Your pastor is not your savior. God. I'm born of God. John chapter 1 verse 12 and 13. One to go. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So there are people who are, are, are given the power to become what? The sons of God. They are not. But once they receive Jesus Christ, a certain dimension of God's grace is given to them the power of God that allows and brings about a new birth. And so they are no longer sons of an earthly father there's a transposition. They become sons of God. And look at what he says in verse 13. He says those people which were born. You see, he's talking about people now who are born. And he says not of blood, not of earthly, because the, the natural man lives by blood. Not nor of the will of the flesh. This is not a fleshly thing. Nor of the will of man. This is not a man working on it. But he says but of God. All of a sudden, he says, they were born of God. God has, now has a child on the face of the earth. Somebody who now carries the DNA, the genes of God, is upon the face of the earth. Because what is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. So now I'm born of the spirit. We sing this song, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine, oh what a foretaste of glory divine. 
heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Do you understand it? So you are now saying that I am born of the spirit. My earthly flesh cannot save me. My earthly flesh is, is, no, 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 no. It's full of sin. It's under the curse of the law. It's full of sickness. It's attracted to sickness. Things are not working. I'm struggling. But I'm not born of the spirit. It's a different ball game. You see, if a goat gives birth to a goat, it will behave like a goat. If a human being gives birth to a human being, it will behave like a human being. If a god gives birth to a, another god, it will behave like a god. You see, the reason why we are struggling in life is because either we are not born again or we are not growing. Because no matter how small a lion is, it is a lion, it's not a dog. It will grow up and roar and become the king. So the question is, who born you? The flesh or the spirit? And you can't fake it. A dog can never become a lion. A cow can never become a lion. Mm. You may try and adopt the traits and try and, oh, but you are not. Because when a lion gives birth, it will grow up to become a lion with the characteristics of a lion. So when we speak about being born again, you see, we are going to be taking on the nature of God and become like God. And if God cannot be defeated, I prophesy to you, no demon fashioned against you shall prosper. Nothing can stop you. Why? Because God is unstoppable. Wherever you go, you are God, you will manifest his presence because you are God. Know ye not that you are gods and you die like men. Because this born again thing is not just a slogan. No. It's true. So this is a process with God himself giving birth and raising his children on earth. Adam is born of the natural flesh. Jesus is born of the incorruptible seed. So the question comes logically. Be why does a person need to be born again? Because God will quicken you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Quickly, my time is. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Let's all read it together. One, two, go. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. So you were dead like Jesus Christ was dead. And then he quickened you. Isn't it? Okay, now look at verse 2. Wherein in time past... You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. He says, before you met Christ, this is how you were like. You were walking according to the course of this world. If the world is going this way, you also go that way. If the world is going that way, you also go that way. He says, according to the prince of the power of the air, you were being ruled by the principalities and the powers. They were influencing you. And the Bible said, that same spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So anybody who is not in Christ actually is being worked on by the, the prince of the power of the air, which is the devil. It means that if you are not in Christ, forget how good you are. You are under demonic influence. You may try to be good, but you are still under him. Because that old nature, God is saying, must die. Because that nature is sinful. And the wages of sin is death. So all that Adamic nature must die. Sinners are spiritually dead. And they receive spiritual life through faith in Christ Jesus. And this is what the Bible likens to being born again. Only those who are born again have their sins forgiven and have a relationship with God. When one is saved, it means that he or she has been born again. 
he has been spiritually renewed and is now a child of God by the right of new birth. Trusting in Jesus Christ, the one who paid the penalty of sin when he died on the cross, is the means to be born again and confessing his lordship over your life and believing that God raised him from the dead is the way to salvation. So Jesus' shocking treatment was far more than Nicodemus expected. Nicodemus was religious without being born again. Hmm. Incredulous, Nicodemus asked him, how can a man be born again when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Certainly this highly educated Pharisee knew that Jesus Christ was not talking about physical reborn. But he replied Jesus in the context of analogy and says that how, how can I start all over again and go back to the beginning? But Jesus Christ was telling him that the gateway or entrance to God's salvation was not a matter of being more religious or adding more rights to your efforts nor topping up your religious devotion but rather cancelling everything and starting all over again a new beginning born again and at the same time Nicodemus could not fully grasp the real meaning and his questions convey his confusion and he openly wondered at the impossibility of Jesus' statement. Jesus was actually acting for something that was humanly impossible. You can't be born again physically. He was making the entrance into the kingdom of heaven contingent on something that doesn't involve human beings and nothing that human effort can do. But unless God himself does it by his divine input and his grace. And that is why the Bible says that we are saved by grace and not of works lest any man should boast. Because the whole born again thing has nothing to do with human effort. Has nothing to do with you becoming more active in church. Has nothing to do with you paying your tithe. Has nothing to do with giving. It has nothing to do with it. It's a work of grace. So if that was true, Nicodemus was a Pharisee whose practice of his faith was based on works. I tithe I fast, I go to the temple, I do this, I purify myself, I go to this festival and that festival. What does born again mean for that religious system? If spiritual rebirth, like physical rebirth, was impossible from a human standpoint, where did it leave people like Nicodemus? So far from minimizing the demands of the gospel, Jesus Christ actually confronted Nicodemus with the most difficult challenge he could make. By asking him to be born again, Jesus is challenging this religious person and his practices of self-righteousness as inadequate for salvation. For the Jews, the more righteous you are, the more you make people feel inferior. So if you're a Pharisee and you go to the temple and you fast and you keep the laws, it made you look upon other people and made them feel inferior. And unfortunately, there are some of us, we make people feel inferior because we think we have an entitlement right. Sometimes the way you talk to people. Sometimes the way you insult people. Sometimes the way you address issues. Listen. True grace doesn't keep you under the law. It makes you sympathetic to human beings. It makes you learn how to treat people with love and compassion. Because you understand that it is not anything that I did that has made me who I am. But it's a work of grace. So you begin to think when you are talking to people when you are calling people names, when you are cursing people, when you are wishing people evil, because you realize that you are saved by grace. I'm sure you've seen as a pastor in this church, I've never cursed anybody. I'm not called to curse, I'm called to bless. But you find a young cell leader who all of a sudden starts coming to church as a cell leader. I'll curse you, I'll curse you. Listen, if you understand grace, you understand grace there are things you won't do then the lord illustrated his point with a very familiar example from nature what did he say he says the wind bloweth where it listeth hmm. you can hear the sound of the wind blowing but you don't know where it is coming from and where it is going so is everyone who is born of the spirit the wind cannot be controlled it blows wherever it wants to blow and though its general direction can be known where it comes from and where the wind is going cannot be precisely determined. Nevertheless, you can observe the effects 
of the wind. And the same is true of the work of the spirit. The sovereign work of regeneration in the human heart cannot be controlled nor predicted. Yet its effect can be seen when somebody says he's born again in their lifestyle and the transformed lives of those who are born by the spirit. Why? Because suddenly you take on the nature of God. You will take on the nature of God. Nobody will have to teach you what is bad, what is wrong. Huh? That is why when somebody says he's born again, all of a sudden, it's like, Nisuba has a son. He used to be a bad boy. He used to be disrespectful. Nisuba has a son. Because now the nature of God is working in you unto good works. You can't fake it. Your heart of stone will become a heart of flesh. If you were rude, you were arrogant, you were disrespectful, you will learn to be polite and you learn to have the milk of human kindness. If you are stealing, nobody will tell you stop. If you are doing bad things, nobody will tell you stop. Because the nature of God, one nature has been taken out and another nature has been put in. The Adamic nature which enjoyed sin, which was being worked on by the spirit of disobedience, that nature has been taken out. And the nature of God, the character of God, now begins to work in you. And I'll tell you something. When you truly become born again, people will notice. They can't explain what has happened to you, but they will notice that there has been a change in Bernard Ashantikwe Adiakwa. I want to address all of you here today. It's beyond clapping your hands and dancing. There is something on the inside which begins to work on the outside. So, what are a few of the things that happens? Quickly. The first one is that the seal of the Holy Spirit. When somebody is born again, something spiritual happens. What is it? The seal of the Holy Ghost. I think I may have to continue this another time. Romans chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. It says, Now if there any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So what makes you a child of God? It's not because you come to church. It's because God himself places a seal. The Bible says, If any man does not have the seal, it means that, you see, when you produce a good product, you put a logo or a trademark on it. And God is saying that if any man does not have the seal, if any man does not have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1, quickly, verse 13 and 14. In whom you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. After you believed, after you gave your life, you said, I receive Jesus Christ. I confess him as Lord. All of a sudden, something divine is placed upon you. It's called a seal. Do you know what a seal is? Don't touch it. Don't open it because it belongs to somebody. You can't touch him. And the spiritual realm notices that seal. The demons notice that seal. And they realize, hands off, this belongs to God. If I touch him, God will touch me. Hello? It says, in whom also after you trusted when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. What does that mean? When you want to marry a girl, what is the first thing you do? You go and give her an engagement ring. The engagement ring means that I'm placing a seal on her I will come back again and come and take her and make her my wife. So he's saying that I'm placing a seal upon you to show you that whilst you are on earth, you are mine. But I'm going and I'll come back and make you my bride. So wh why are you a child of God? Because I go to church. No, because I have a seal. The Holy Ghost on my life. The seal of redemption. I'm wearing an engagement ring. That's the seal. That's the promise that no, nobody can come, can come for me again. I belong to the Lord. I don't belong to any river God. I don't belong to any idol. I don't belong to any fetish priest. No, I belong to God. 
why the seal of redemption the holy spirit of promise is upon me so the question i ask you do you have the seal of the holy ghost or you just go to church Number two, there will be an inner witness. Verse 15. Verse 15. No. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Quickly. Romans chapter 8. What does it say? For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. I'm a child of God. What shows that I'm a child of God? When I see my daddy coming or my mommy coming, I, 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 I just reach out. You see, and forgive me for speaking, every child, nobody teaches a child who your parents are. You are crying, you are shouting. Every, everything, you are crying, shouting, you are hungry. And then all of a sudden, mommy comes around and begins to do something. Or then you just hold mommy's hands. And then it's over. Why? Because intuitively, you know. The Bible is saying that when you are born again, the spirit of adoption is placed in you. You will know that there's something that now draws you to your father. There's something that draws you to God. You want to be in the presence of God. It's not somebody coming to rigidly follow you up. Of course, we will help you. But it's not somebody to come and carry you and beg you to come. Because there is something following you inside you. Intuitively, you know your father. It's the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba Father, Abba Father. I want to be with my Father. I want to be with my Father. I want to be in the house of the Lord. You see, there are people who have been Christians for a long while. You are talking to them, fair, won't come. We are tired. We we'll sit at home. We'll... Sometimes you wonder what kind of generation you are dealing with. How they ended up in church in the choir as prayer warriors without. The spirit of adoption where they cry Abba Father how can I teach you all this because I know I have an experience I know how I've grown up I'm not just a church member going to church I'm a child of God worshipping and serving my father number three verse 16 Romans chapter 8 verse 16 and 17 Everybody, quickly, one, two, go. My time is up. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, we may also be glorified with him. So there is something, an inner witness that now confirms that you're a child of God. They talk to you, who are you? I'm a child of God. You can't explain, but I'm a child of God. I know I'm a child of God. I know I'm born again. Now my, my, I trace my lineage to a spirit, the spiritual realm, not to the physical. Um, everybody says, you are the son of Mr. Diakwa, but I'm also a child of God. It means that I have a father. He now watches over me. My heavenly father is much greater and bigger than my earthly father. My earthly father may be a drunkard. My earthly father may be irresponsible, but now heavenly father, watch any young way. He looks after me. He watches over me. He protects me. He's greater. He's not limited. He can supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He is my heavenly father. If you are going to exercise authority as a believer, there are some foundations you need. Oh, my time is up, so I have to close. There are some foundations you must have. And if the foundations are weak, you struggle. Let's rise to our feet.